Great, so um, I'm going to get this started properly then, I think. Uh, welcome to this week's Remote Cafe Sai. Uh, and Dave, can I just mention that's a lot better with your microphone held there, so if you could keep that up, that would be great. Um, yeah, so I'm going to try and be in charge of the tech a bit for this meeting. Um, we have had some issues with um, Dave, our speaker, being a bit quiet, um, but unfortunately the volume is turned up all the way on his end, so if um, you do struggle to understand later, if you could just turn the volume up on your end as well, I think that's probably the easiest fix. Uh, so as always, just to let you know, we will be recording this meeting. So if you don't want to be seen, just feel free to turn your camera off. Um, and you will be able to find this and past recordings on our YouTube channel. Um, it's nice to see so many people despite the good weather. I think we've really got some competition today. Um, just to let you know something that's been pointed out to us, when the presentation starts or now, you will still see the video um, of the individual people. And... Um, you can actually move that around um, by just dragging and dropping if it should cover any parts on the slides. Um, otherwise, I think I'm going to pass you straight on to Sam, who's going to be chairing the session. So over to you. Well, thanks, David. Um, yeah, so as David said, welcome to the talk. Um, we This is our number six now, so um, it's nice to see so many of you here so frequently. Um, if you haven't been here before, just to let you know how this kind of works, um, so we'll have a talk by Dave, which will last about sort of 20 to 30 minutes, um, and then we'll go into the Q&A section um, of the talk. So um, if you want, you can sort of ask a question in person like this, not in person, virtually in person like this, um, or you can drop your question in the chat and I can read it out and Dave can answer it. Uh, so you should have a little bar at the bottom of your screen and there's a little chat box icon. So if you click on that, you can answer your, you can type your question in there. Um, and yeah, so that's basically how it will work. So um, Dave is a PhD student at the University of Exeter. He's also an absolutely amazing photographer and he delivered a brilliant talk for me and my fellow master's students quite frequently, quite recently, um, before we went out to Kenya. So I've asked him to do a talk for us today and hopefully you'll really enjoy it. So I will pass on to Dave. Thanks very much. Um, thank you. Thanks very much for everyone joining us this evening. Uh, I appreciate that it's very sunny outside, um, but thanks very much for coming to listen to me jabbering on about uh, some wildlife photography. Um, apologies if I sound a bit quiet. The, the microphone seems to be playing up a little bit on my end, uh, but it does mean that I've got one massive hand in front of my screen. Uh, it's not that big, really. It's just that it's a little bit closer to the, to the, to the uh, camera than, than I am. Um, but hopefully you can all hear me and I'll try and speak really clearly. Uh, so yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk to you uh, a little bit about um, wildlife photography. This is something that I've been doing for quite some years now uh, and I'm going to try and share some of my, my kind of things that I do and hopefully by the end of it you'll kind of uh, have some sort of, uh, you some sort of few tips that you can take away with you and hopefully improve the photography that you do. Um, as we go through, you'll see on the, the kind of top left hand corner of the, 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 the photographs that I'm sharing, there's the, the settings that I've used for that particular photograph. Now, uh, I'm not expecting you necessarily all to understand what they're on about, and I will touch on those settings towards the end um, of the, the presentation, but there's loads of stuff that you can do without understanding anything about the settings. Uh, so I will get going with that. Um, so a little kind of outline to what I'm going to be talking to you about. Uh, first of all, I'll talk a little bit about planning um, and then touch on some field craft and hopefully help you to find some uh, wildlife to take photos of. And then I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about the composition of your photos, because this is the thing that absolutely everyone can do, that whether you're using your, your mobile phone or you've got a most expensive digital SLR camera. If you're not composing the shot right, then it's never going to look that great. Uh, so then I'll touch on maximising your equipment, and then hopefully if I've got to time and uh, there's still some people interested, then I'll talk a little bit about the camera settings that you guys can use uh, to suit particular situations so that you may have a better, better understanding of, of what you're doing. Um, if you want to stick it on auto and just click away, then that's fine. Uh, but you might want to also kind of enjoy uh, experimenting with your camera. So, first of all, planning. Now, you know, um, certainly the, the photography that I do, I feel like that you can kind of split it into two, two main types. There's the kind of ad hoc types of wildlife photography where 
you haven't really got any plan as such you're just kind of going out for a walk in, in the countryside or whatever you're going to take photographs of whatever it is that you you kind of come across and then there's also the kind of much more planned photography shoot where you've got a, maybe a specific uh, a species in mind a specific uh, individual in mind uh, at a specific location and all the rest of it certainly you know, when I started out, I definitely did uh, the vast majority of kind of ad hoc stuff, just take my camera out when I'm out walking uh, and see what I can photograph. And, you know, as I've gone on and got more into it, I've become more kind of obsessed, if you like. And uh, so now I tend to do a lot more of the, the kind of planned focus shoots, uh, which are really fun. Uh, uh, the next couple of slides I'm going to be talking about really are focused on... Um, that kind of more planned aspect of wildlife photography, but there's certainly bits and pieces that you can take with you if you just kind of want to do the wildlife walk in, see what you come across, um, but it'll just involve you guys thinking on your feet a little bit more, and um, yeah, you might have to just uh, cuff it a little bit, and um, yeah, yeah, you'd be fine. So, um, now, the, the, the kind of first thing you want to do is really get a grip on, on what it is you might come across. Certainly, uh, when we're talking in, in this country, uh, a good knowledge of what animals you might come across uh, is, is wonderful. It, not only does it kind of make it a little bit more interesting for yourself, particularly with the bird species and stuff, which, uh, you know, there's, there's a whole much more range than, than perhaps the mammals. But... Um, if you get to know the, the, the species that you're trying to photograph, then you can learn to st start to anticipate what they might do. You can plan accordingly. You can understand what their behavior might be, how they may react to, to seeing you, uh, and, and how you can perhaps minimize your, your disturbance upon them. Uh, it's something that I'm really you know, massively focused upon is, is trying not to disturb the animals as much as possible. Obviously, you know, there's occasions when that, that may or may not happen and it may, may not be anything of your fault, but if you can minimise those kind of uh, disturbance issues, then uh, you're going to get much better photos uh, at the end of the day. So, um, a good starting point for me is is an OS map. Um, now OS maps are online. You can pay I don't know 20 quid for a year subscription or something, and gives you access to every ordnance survey map uh, for the whole country. And what I can strongly recommend, and what has really come about from um, this time of kind of lockdown is getting to know your local patch. So I, you know, sometimes will look at the map, uh, find a footpath that I've not been along and try and plan a, a, a dog walk around it or, or something along those sorts of lines uh, just to kind of get to know what's about there. And then tying that in with your knowledge that you might have done a bit of research on what is living there, you might find suitable habitats and you might go, well, this is a perfect spot for badgers. So I should be looking out for badger signs. This is a perfect spot for uh, um, foxes. So I'm going to be looking for fox signs and all those sorts of things. And so to start with, I mean, the vast majority of my kind of wildlife uh, locations, if you like, have really come from being out with the dog. Fortunately, my dog's a pretty slow walker. He's 90% of the time he's behind me and I'm dragging him along. So he doesn't really disturb any wildlife. So I'm able to really take in my surroundings start to pick up those field signs which i'm going to come on to in a second um and then you can start you know understanding what you might see and that's the first step really to then getting some good wildlife photos um on the day or on the occasion that you you kind of actually do go out you want to be aware of your surroundings particularly uh the kind of light and the wind so your shadows can be cast so that's one thing that i'll talk about in a minute but specifically, most of the, the animals you, you see, particularly, you know, we're not talking birds here, but everything else, they'll, they'll pick up your scent long before you get there. So if you're, you know, if you've got an awareness of where your wind's coming from and where your scent might be travelling to, you can also have an understanding of where you're less likely to see any wildlife and so you can focus your attentions elsewhere. Um, also, the weather, um, it's also good to know, you know, this will all start building into the kind of setups that you use for your camera. Um, understanding whether it's a cloudy day, a sunny day, are there going to be shadows cast, are you going to get a clear shot of their face or, or, or whatever, um, is all considerations that the more you do it, it will become more and more natural. Um, but, you know, as you're starting out, just try and have a little bit of an awareness of these sorts of things. Uh, and I promise you that your photographs will, will start to improve. 
Um, also, if you're looking for a specific kind of uh, wildlife shot that you're wanting, um, then a little bit of preparation in terms of your equipment, making sure that you, you kind of, do you need a tripod? Should you take your tripod? What sort of time of day are you going out? All those sorts of things. Do you need spare batteries, et cetera, et cetera. Get all that out of the way because you don't want to be out there in the field uh, with, with a perfect badger in front of you and your battery dies or you, you, know, you're, you can't hold the camera still enough because it's too far away and you haven't got your tripod, etc. So try and do as much as planning as possible and uh, you know, you'll, you'll get there. So a little bit about uh, field craft. Now, for me, this is part of the, the kind of wildlife experience that I really enjoy the most. Uh, getting up and close to nature without them realising, without them noticing, is is a, a kind of big thrill for me, if you like. Um, going out and about, looking for field signs. This photograph at the top here, which is with the bluebells, uh, this is just along from where uh, just at the very start of the presentation was taken. Um, and you can see a quite a clearly defined badger track through these bluebells. Um, and, and to be honest with you, the, the badgers, Badgers are a fairly easy species to kind of locate. They're, they're somewhat more difficult to take photos of because they like to come out at dusk, at darkness. Um, but to find them is, is relatively easy. Uh, whereas perhaps foxes, they, they may be out a bit more in the late, in the, in the daylight, but they're, they're kind of a lot harder to come across. So looking for field signs is a great one. You know, little wildlife tracks, through hedges, little holes, this sort of thing, uh, a great indicator. And particularly with things like badgers, you can often, if you follow one of these footpaths uh, through, the, through the woods, you'll come across a set and then you can start planning your shot from there. Um, I've put trail cams up there. I mean, I've used trail cameras now for you know four or five years and there's nothing better, I promise you, there's nothing better than getting your trail camera back home, plugging in the memory card and seeing what you found on it. Sadly, there's, all, <laughs> there's often a lot of photographs of uh, leaps moving, but if you get the settings right, then you've got a good chance of collecting some, some lovely shots. Um, I've put a little link down there at the bottom. Well, it's not a link, but uh, the description. I've, I've got two camera traps. Uh, one's much more expensive than the other one. And to be honest, there's not an awful lot of difference between them. The cheap one, the, the link is down the bottom there, is, is only £40. Um, and it takes some lovely, lovely photos. And to be honest with you, I, I use trail cameras to... Um, try and locate and, and understand the behavior of the animals rather than using the photos themselves that they take. So I'll put the tra camera traps up where I think there'll be the most activity um, and then I can observe that footage later on and, and work out kind of where I might sit with my camera um, and, and, and take photos like that. Now, <coughs> excuse me, um, camouflage is the kind of next thing. Now you can see on this photo on the bottom right hand corner, it's an absolutely flattering photo of me. And um, I took this one a little selfie the other night, uh, set on a hedge. Now I do have a ghillie suit here, it's not essential by any means, but I, I do find that it, it helps. Again, this is an expensive piece of kit, um, but it does just go to help um, kind of conceal yourself. I like to get into position early, and sit there for a, you know, a decent period of time before I think the animals might appear. And then any scent, that, might, that is, is there may have, you know, may well have dis, dissipated from my entry position. Um, but equally, they're a lot less likely to see me. Like this position I was in the other day, uh, uh, I had rabbits, you know, two meters away from me, happily eating without any knowledge of, of me being there. So camouflage is something uh, to think about. Um, just wearing dark colors is a good start. Trying to match into your background. You don't need to go for uh, you know, proper army print camo or anything, but just having some some dull colours is a good start, um, which you know will help you get closer to the wildlife. Um, then have a think about the environment that you're going to be taking photos in. Um, you know, what is on the ground? Is it nettles? Is it brambles? Is it bluebells? Is it you know thick, high, tall grass? Is it short grass? And all these things will start feeding into how you're going to take your photo, how you're going to prepare to take your photo, how high you want to set your camera up um, and things like that. And also it will go into kind of thinking about what you want to be wearing. I've got a particularly thick pair of trousers that I wear uh, if I'm going through nettles, for example. 
Um, whereas perhaps uh, if I wasn't going through nettles, I might be, especially this time of year, be wearing a much thinner pair of trousers. That sort of thing all makes for uh, a kind of a much more comfortable um, experience whilst you're you're taking the photos. Uh, and then you can think about how you move around. Um, I'm going to talk you through a little planning session in a second, but how you move around whilst you're trying to get close to the wildlife, thinking about the wind, uh, the wind direction, for example, thinking about uh, where you might be casting a shadow. Um, I always try and follow boundary edges, which, you know, rather than being out in the open. If I'm coming over the brow of the hill, then you know I'll be right down low on the ground rather than breaking the, the, the horizon. Um, all things like that can, can actually make a huge difference and you'd be surprised um, how many chance encounters you'll have just by being a bit more careful about how you move around um, along these footpaths or through the fields. And then um, also thinking about what time of day. Now this comes back a little bit to uh, the kind of behaviour side of things, knowing when the animals are going to most likely be moving about and most likely to be active, um, specifically with, well, even birds as well, but I was thinking mammals, the, the kind of dawn and dusk are always going to be your most active time of day. So that either means you have to get up really early and get in position beforehand, or you go kind of mid-afternoon and get yourselves ready for the, for the evening. Um, and it might be a case of one, one or the other for each different situation. And there's a photo coming up that I'll show you with a, a bag of set that's fairly near to me where I am. And I haven't had much luck in the evenings. Um, you know, they were always coming out after dark. It was too dark to take a photo. So I decided, well, I could try in the morning and see if I can catch them on their way back to bed. And sure enough, I got up at four o'clock, uh, sat in the same position. And I must have had four or five badgers all walking straight past me, back to their set over the next hour, hour and a half, um, with the last one still being, you know, in, in pretty good light for a photo. So think about the time of day. <coughs> There's a couple of links here. Um, so Photo Pills, I don't know how some of you might be aware of this, is uh, an app that you can get. I think it's 4 99 but it, it's a really great investment. Um, it's got loads of different features on there, but the one that I, I like the most of is it's got this kind of a sunset and sunrise thing where it will tell you the exact direction that the sun is going to rise from, the sun is going to set from, and it will change obviously every day. And so it really makes planning a, a kind of wildlife shot really, really easy. Um, the OS Maps um, service online, which you can see down the bottom here, uh, is, is the next kind of thing I'm going to talk about. So this is a, an area of land. Can you see my mouse? I think you probably can. There's a little hand which is hovering over the image. Um, so this is an area really near me. This is the Gano Estuary here. There's a footpath along here. There's also a footpath which goes along the back here, uh, along this edge. Um, and I'm, well, there isn't a badger set there. I wish there was because this is really close to where I live. But let's pretend that, that uh, on one of my dog walks, I found uh, some badger activity or even fox activity up in this corner here. Um, I can start then planning my shoot. So think about what time of day you're going to go. So the sun I know sets. Uh, over to the right hand side of the screen here. So I know that if I walk up, if I was to walk up this edge here, then I'm going to be in shadow and quite likely to uh, hide myself or it's going to be a lot easier to conceal myself without uh, getting spotted. Um, obviously I'm going to ideally want kind of uh, a, a, a sunny day just to prolong the, the daylight hours as much as possible and give me as much light as I can. But then thinking about the photograph that I want to take, do I want to have a bat lick subject, in which case obviously I perhaps need to try and set myself up over this side, in which case I'd be entering from a different side. Or do I want to try and get the, 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 the sun actually onto the, the subject themselves, in which case this, this boundary edge here is probably quite a good place to start. So how am I going to get into position? <clears throat> so this will depend on the fact that I'm going to take, so either along this boundary edge or up through this boundary edge. I'd need to check the wind, and so if the wind was coming from the left-hand side of the screen, then obviously I couldn't approach from this side because my scent would be on the badgers, and badgers are notoriously, uh, uh, you know, they'll sniff me out way before I get there, and they, they'll hold fire. They won't come out their holes until it's much darker. So what sort of time do you want to be in position? 
particularly for badgers, you probably want to be in position and comfortably settled at least an hour before sunset. Um, foxes and other things, you can, you, you know, it'll be very different. <coughs> Uh, I've got a fox set near me where I've just well, I've just gone to assess it a second ago, and uh, the male fox was already out in the field, um, and that was what four o'clock in the afternoon. So realistically, if I wanted to make sure I was in position before he appeared, then maybe I'd have to get there at three o'clock in the afternoon, and, and it would be quite a long wait um, for anything anything good. <coughs> You might get lucky you know, that's, the, that's the thing like you can do as much planning as you like but you can get very lucky um, and you don't have to necessarily sit there for hours upon end um, but i like to think you know i mean i went up there yesterday and spent four or four hours sat in a hedge i saw uh one fox cub's tail for about mm, five seconds as it ran away from me uh obviously no photos <clears throat> But it's putting in the time and it's understanding, right, okay, I know where that, that, that the fox has appeared from. Um, so I can maybe be, position myself a little bit better next time I go. Um, that sort of thing. Um, you set that position, you want to be comfy. Um, you know, I'll talk a little bit about composition in a second, but you want to be in a comfy position because you're going to be sat there for some time uh, and you don't want to have to move around too much and make loads of noise. Um, a tripod is, is not essential, but it, again, it definitely helps in terms of your camera can be ready in a position to take a photo rather than being resting on the ground. Um, if your camera's lightweight, then maybe that's not so much of an issue, but if you've got a big lens, then you want it in position, waiting to go, rather than the fox appears. You have to lift your camera, that starts the fox and off it goes. Um, it's a good idea to to kind of have a plan of how long you're going to sit there for. Um, yesterday I had a deadline that I needed to be back for, and so I was aware that at that sort of time I needed to be thinking about leaving. Um, but on that note, you want to think about your exit strategy. Um, you don't want to disturb the animals. That's you know that's the worst thing possible is that you've been sat there. So you know if you're adamant that you've got to leave by a certain point, give yourself plenty of time because um, what you don't want to happen is five minutes before you leave, the animals appear. You don't want to move, you don't want to disturb them. Um, and so that, you know, if you have to have to leave, then you're going to have to disturb them. And, you know, that's, that's no good for anyone. So, um, a little bit about equipment. Uh, one of the things I put in my equipment is my binoculars. Uh, great for spotting wildlife, a lot lighter to carry around than the camera. Um, you know, you can take these every walk you go on and, and start to, to see stuff. Um, I've got, well, those are the ones that I've got and I can strongly recommend them. Um, use them all the time and uh, very good. Then you could have a digital SLR, obviously a little bit more expensive, or this is kind of the top end. You can spend anything from uh, kind of 250 pounds up to many thousands of pounds. Uh, second hand is, is a good way to go. Um, I can recommend you some cameras if you, if you want to get into that side of things. The next step is kind of your bridge camera. Again, this isn't like a list of what you should have and, and you know what you should be working towards. There's no uh, kind of big lens snobbery. You know, all these cameras you can take great, great, great photos with. Um, so a bridge camera is, is compact. Um, you're much more likely to take it with you. I mean, my backpack that that I carry around with me probably weighs. Well, so it's just under 15 kilos, um, and so that's an awful lot to be carrying around just on the off chance that you might see something. So by no means, don't worry if you if you just want to stick with a bridge camera. And equally, mobiles are getting much, much better um, at taking photos, and you can get much, uh, you know, you can get great, sh great shots just with your mobile. Now, the, the photo on the end there <coughs> um, is actually a bit of a combination shot. So using uh, your mobile together with your, your binoculars. Uh, and so I, I've got my own example here. So this is down the gunnel uh, near where I live. And you can see this is the mobile phone camera just without anything. Uh, looking across the gunnel, we get lovely seabirds here. Uh, but then stick your binoculars in front of them. It takes a little while to get them kind of lined up. So, uh, but you can get kind of, the more you do it, the more practice you get. And all of a sudden you've got, you know, a, a pretty good zoom on your mobile. And it, this is an optical zoom and it's not a digital zoom. So the clarity of the picture is actually pretty good. 
Um, yes, you've got the circular image, but you know you could crop in quite nicely and get quite a half decent shot um, just by using that method. So please don't think that you have to spend lots of money on 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 equipment. Um, so uh, composition. Now, without decent composition, you know your photographs are never going to look particularly amazing. Um, there's a couple of things to consider when you're when you're taking that photo. If you've got the time to consider all these things, then great. You might not have the the animal might be running off into the distance as you snap away, um, but you know you can have an idea. And the more you do it, the the more the more you'll kind of just naturally move your camera into those sorts of positions. Um, <clears throat> obviously, quite a lot of this composition stuff you can do in post post processing. Uh, there's a couple of images of this uh, hyena that I think Sam might have seen as well. Um, this is a, a juvenile uh, hyena, and I'll talk about those the kind of frames. But you can see that how you know these these specific ways of lining up your photographs uh, 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 in kind of post processing can actually improve the, the style of the shot. So a couple of considerations. First of all, uh, uh, can you and and um, do you want to fill the frame with your subject? Now, in certain instances, then yes, you would. Um, you know, the, the cheetah shot in the top right-hand corner, obviously I've gone for a close-up shot of the cheetahs. Um, you know, just head and shoulders. If you're going for a head shot, then just do head and shoulders. Don't cut the body in half or anything like that. Just go for head and shoulders alone, um, if not tighter if you want to, if you want to do a specific, uh, you know, an eye shot or whatever. Um, but try and fill the frame. Don't do a half-half. Equally, if you don't want to fill the frame with the subject and you want a bit more, um, you know, room to breathe for the animal, if you're going to do a, a, an entire shot of an animal, um, like the fox, for example, in the bottom and the middle, I've given the, the subject a little bit of room to breathe. Uh, it's an idea of the habitat that he's living in. And I think, to be honest, it might not work on Instagram so well, but it, it's, as a framed print, you know, it, it's a much better shot. It's a much nicer shot. Um, than, than perhaps just the fox, uh, if it was tight in on the fox itself. The, uh, the bad shot at the top there, uh, you might not be able to see it, I don't know, it depends how big your screen is, but the badger, this is one of the 4 a.m. start badgers um, in a local area to me. He's wandering home straight towards me, ended up about a metre and a half away from me at the last point, which was useless for my camera with my big lens on it, but it was quite a nice experience. Again, this is giving an idea of the habitat of this particular badger. So as you can see, this is an urban environment. It's not a woodland badger. And, and you know, that gives another, uh, an element to your photograph of, of you know, that you're storytelling. Um, <clears throat> the lions, I, I've kind of put that as, as a bit of an example of maybe, you know, something you might not want to do. I don't particularly like the crop that I've done on this photo. Um, it's quite nice to see the male line looking at the female, and I think I've gone for that. That's why I've kind of cropped in so close. But um, when I was going through these photos, preparing this this presentation, I actually thought, well, it's a bit too tight. Um, it's 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 kind of cutting the bodies in half a little bit. I've cut the tails off both of them, um, and so potentially slightly more zoomed out. But I think I probably did that for Instagram. In which case, you you know, generally speaking, you'd you'd want to be a bit closer. So think about the background. Um, is that important or is it distracting? Do you want to include it or do you want to kind of exclude it? Think about the foreground equally. Uh, it might be uh, distracting or it might be, you know, a good thing to add in there. Uh, and then there's a couple of different rules that you can kind of follow. Uh, there's, I mean, there's a whole host of rules if you start looking at photographic composition online. Um, the one I, quite, I kind of resort to most is, is the kind of rule of thirds, which is the, the grid that's over the hyena. So trying to place things um, on those kind of PowerPoints, if you like. Uh, there's also the, the golden spiral, I think it's called, I can't remember. Um, yeah, the golden spiral, which is the other option with the face in the center of that spiral. The good thing about animals is, you know, they've got an eyesight, they've got a, a way that they'll be looking. You might not always have them directing themselves at the camera. So you might want to give some space for them to be looking into. So that's a good example with the, with the hyena there. It's looking into the other corner of the shot. And so that actually kind of provides a bit of a leading line for a, a viewer's eyes. Um, it's a bit more obvious in the, the bottom left-hand corner shot. 
uh, of the track leading yourselves, leading the, the, the viewer in from the bottom right hand corner into the, the kind of middle of the photograph. And so they're much more likely uh, to, to stay looking at that photo for a little bit longer if you've got something that, that kind of leads the, the, uh, the viewer through, through the photograph. Now, the last thing I put there is the, the focus point. Now, this is the, the kind of crucial bit of, of taking any photograph is having the right bit of the, the frame in focus. Um, I'll talk a little bit about your camera settings in a moment, and that there's a few things that you can do to kind of prove your composition. But any animal, bird, or whatever, if you've got the eye in focus, you can pretty much get away with the photo. Um, you know, there's certain instances where you might want some blur, you might want to introduce some blur, uh, and I'll mention that in a second. But ultimately, um, you know, you want the, the the individual's eye to be in focus. If that's gone, then the people who are looking at the photo, they won't necessarily be able to engage with that photo quite so well. Um, and so that, you know, that's that's the most important bit uh, for me. <clears throat> uh, in an ideal world, you'd, you'd kind of separate out the the individual from the foreground and the background. Uh, I think the next slide is a bit of an example of that. Um, so this is a Maxmar, um, again, if you can get the opportunity to go there in autumn, then it's amazing to hear the red deer rutting uh, and bellowing out there. Well, certainly there's the stags bellowing out in the morning. So this is uh, an unedited photo. Um, and the couple of decisions that I have to make on the hoof, this was, you know, I was basically walking through undergrowth uh, trying to track these, these red deer. This photo, I don't, you know, it's lovely photo but I don't particularly like it for a number of reasons so the the, the, the stag itself isn't necessarily separated from the background um, it's kind of lost doesn't pop out of the image um, the foreground is 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 fine but again I've probably got potentially a little bit too much in focus which I'll talk about in a minute the the the, the deer itself is in focus but also perhaps a little bit too much of the, the background is is focused um, you can see that f5.6 at 600 millimeters, which means basically that there's quite a there's there's, a, there's going to be a chunk of, of space which is all in focus, which I think means that um, the the deer doesn't actually pop out the photo. A lot of the time, you can fix this sort of stuff in post processing. Um, so I've overdone this. This is how I'd leave the photo, but you can see uh, if I flick between the two that. Um, <coughs> With post processing nowadays, you can there's, there's still you know you can save an awful lot of photographs which potentially wouldn't have been very good in the past um, with a little bit of clever editing. Um, yeah, but like I say, I've kind of overdone that one. So just to kind of show you that um, what is possible. Um, so I'm going to just touch briefly on the camera settings um, and and something. Um, there's kind of it's, it's always going to be a balancing act to, of a number of different things. Um, the ISO, which is the kind of sensitivity of your your sensor or your film. Then we've got the the aperture, which is the f value, and then we've also got the shutter speed, which is how uh, quickly the the shutter opens and closes. So, talking about ISO, um, you can I, I often leave my ISO on auto, which um, with a maximum setting so it won't go over a particular setting but it will adjust so that i can get the shutter speed uh, and aperture that i want um, there's some examples here so you know the low numbers uh, are basically that there's not a very sensitive uh, picture but these are the numbers that you want to be using if you've got a lot of light um, so i've kind of crudely done a little little example here um, going up from 200 up to 10,000. And what you want to do, the more light you have, the, the kind of more freedom you have to, to set everything else. So using the kind of a, a mid ISO to, to then enable you to speed up the shutter speed might mean that you can get a much more focused shot um, or it might allow you to, to kind of close or open the aperture a little bit as to depending on what you want to take. Now you might say just stick up the highest thing as possible and that gives you the most light or whatever, the most sensitivity, but that comes at a cost. And so this is a, a zoomed in picture of that last one, the bottom right hand corner. And as you can see in, uh, in my dog's face, that there's quite a lot of, there's a, quite a, a, a nasty grain to the photograph. And so this is, 
this is uh, noise which is introduced because the sensors uh, on its kind of maximum sensitivity and you can get rid of a bit of it in post-processing but it's never going to be as, as crystal clear as something that you've taken on uh, say ISO kind of 640, 800. That's kind of roughly where I would like in an ideal world. Every camera is slightly different um, and every camera will have a kind of default you know perfect setting and uh, so it's worth reading up on the, the kind of manuals to find out what that is. Um, and then we've got the aperture and so this is essentially how big the hole is that uh, the, the shutter opens to and then closes to and so it's kind of confusing well I guess it's not that confusing but the low numbers refer to a large aperture and then the high numbers refer to a, a small aperture and so the low numbers f2.8 something like that means that the the shutter is opening really wide so it's going to let a lot of light in um, and then the the um, so the low apertures, so the high numbers, so f16 and above, they're a much smaller hole, so it's only letting a little pinprick of light come through. And so you can obviously, you know, there's an optimal light uh, uh, or amount of light that you need to correctly expose your photograph. And so you can see, obviously, if you've got a big hole, then you can probably have a much shorter uh, shutter speed. If you've got a little hole, then you're going to need a little bit more time to let that light come through. Again, this is a balancing act, and so the, the bonus of having a, a large aperture, a small number, is that you can control the depth of field. And so in the top photo here of my dog, you can see I've got it on F4, which is quite a low aperture, and you can see that the foreground is out of focus and the background is out of focus, but Nick's himself, the dog, he is in focus. So the whole of Nick's will be in focus there, um, and that just adds to the kind of separation between the foreground and the background which I perhaps didn't have with the, the deer photo uh, from a couple of slides ago and so often with wildlife you know it's a balancing act and it's getting used to what sort of values you need to play with uh, and use um, to take your photos to, to make that subject pop from the background and so you can see that in the bottom photo I've used f16 which is a much smaller aperture but that's giving a much larger depth of field. And so a lot more of the photograph is actually in focus there, uh, which means that perhaps Nick doesn't, he's not standing out from the photo quite so much. Um, and, and it's not quite as pretty, in inverted commas, uh, um, a picture. Um, now, again, you don't want to necessarily always stick to the really low numbers. You, want to, you might want to hover in the middle, depending on your subject, depending on your situation. Um, will 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 depend on that. You know, you might only have f uh, four. You might, in this instance, I've probably got about a meter, maybe two meters of of focused space. Whereas if I was much closer to it and the animal was much smaller, so say I'm taking a photo of a badger. If I was to use f four um, and had quite a close view from the badger, then I might only get his head in focus, and I might want his whole body in focus. And so you you've got to play that balancing act out to try and get. Um, you know, as much or as little as, as you want focused, focusing on the eye, obviously. Now, lastly, is the shutter speed. Uh, so the two pretty rubbishy photos just snapped down the gunnel earlier. Um, the shutter speed is obviously how long the, the, um, the shutter is open for. So a nice quick shutter speed will freeze the, the motion. And this is particularly great if you're, you know, if you're hand holding a big lens and you can't keep it steady very quickly or very well, sorry, then you want a fast shutter speed to freeze that motion so that any kind of movement that you're inducing from your inability to hold the camera steady will be frozen out of the camera. Um, equally, you might want to slow it down. Um, so the bottom photo, you know, this is a, a panning style. So I'm trying to in kind of tell the viewer that the, the bird's flying and it's moving so I've, I've used a much slower shutter speed but I've had to move the camera with the bird so this takes a bit of practice and so if you move the camera with the bird then you, you know you get a nice blurred background which, which gives this feeling of motion um, it's not easy and it, it, you know it takes a lot of you know a fair bit of practice shots and you'll get a few <laughs> plenty of rubbish ones in amongst the good ones um, but you can get quite a nice effect at the end of it um, of a bird flapping its wings or a bird flying or, or you know, an animal moving. Um, I strongly, you know, if you want to get into this sort of stuff, then go out and practice. Uh, and don't be worried about firing off plenty of shots. 
Uh, my dog is very used to being photographed. He knows the shutter speed, the, the shutter noise, and he'll come for a treat every time he hears it click, which isn't always ideal. But he is a great subject, and I can I can maneuver him around and practice an awful lot of different things um, with him. You know, moving around and, and, and all those sorts of different settings, and can set up shots uh, and practice that way, which is um, you know it's a great help. So I'm not going to necessarily talk about the focal length. That's just um, something about zooming um, and deciding on on your composition of your shot. And you might not have that option anyway. Particularly if you're using on your phone, zooming in on your phone isn't always great because it's a digital zoom, so it's just enlarging the pixels. Um, you want to try and get closer if possible. Um, and so this kind of balancing act. On the one side, we've got the, the settings of your camera, so the ISO, the aperture, and the shutter speed. And on the other side, you've got uh, what subject you're trying to take a photo of, the situation that you might be in, be that you know a planned shot or, or just happening to be walking around doing the wildlife walk. Uh, you've also got the light to consider. So are you trying to get the light on your face, or is it the light going to be is it a back to the subject? And that all comes into the what shot that you're trying to take. Uh, but equally, if you're not on a planned shoot, then it's what shot you you can take in that situation. But the better understanding that you have of all these things means that you can you know manipulate them to your to your advantage and then get the, the, the best shot possible. Um, so just lastly, I think this is lastly, yeah. Um, talk about the, the kind of modes that you can use on your cameras. Most cameras have got this sort of dial here with a few presets, and then we've got three different levels of kind of um, operator input. So manual you control everything. Shutter priority um, is basically, you know, you control the shutter speed and then it'll adjust everything else. And then we've got aperture priority whereby you adjust the aperture and it'll adjust everything else. So a good starting block, if you've not used these modes before, I would suggest you start with uh, aperture priority. Um, you can probably set within your settings a shutter speed at a particular minimum speed. So, because you want to, you know, you want to be freezing motion most of the time. So if you set your, set your minimum shutter speed to say you know one two hundredth of a second or something like that, then you can play around with the aperture and you you can see what effect that's happening and you can get used to take, taking photos that way. Um, shutter priority I don't I very very rarely use so I should work with that. But once you've you've kind of mastered the aperture priority, then move yourself onto manual and then you'll you'll start to understand a lot more of what's going on with your camera. Um, and how fast you need to set, set the shutter to freeze particular motion in particular light situations. And like I said before, with the ISO, um, I normally set my ISO to a maximum of, say, uh, 6,000, somewhere in that region. 6,400 is not normally what I have. Um, and then the camera can then adjust the ISO up to that point um, to try and get my other settings in place. So I'll have, a, I'll have an idea of the aperture. Um, set particularly for a particular shot and then I'll have a shutter speed which I'll be adjusting depending on what the animal is doing and then the ISO will automatically uh, uh, move around. I will sometimes go higher than 6400 but I'd like to be able to make that decision rather than the camera making it for me. Um, it was like that was just something about what um, uh, type of photograph you're going to take um, if you have the option of shooting in RAW, then then that's great, but it does require you to do some bit of post-processing. Um, if you shoot in RAW and JPEG, then that's that's great because it means you don't necessarily have to do any editing afterwards. And if you just want to shoot in JPEG, then your photos, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that your photo is only worse or anything, but it's done some post-processing for you. And so uh, your photo will look a little bit more vibrant than if you're shooting in RAW. But equally, you might not be able to save it so much if you've um, got a, a great photo, but it's it's underexposed or overexposed. Um, lastly, uh, just a bit about being trigger happy um, in terms of reeling off your shutter. You know, it's all well and good having a fast shutter, you know, that you can reel off a thousand shots a second or whatever, but just consider the time that it's going to take you to go through those shots. And also, particularly in this country where the wildlife isn't always necessarily so used to hearing shutters, then you you know every click of that shutter is an opportunity for the the, the animal to get scared and, and and disappear. So just be, you know, 
consider it and be wise in terms of how how much you're going to press the press the trigger. Um, think about behaviour uh, and what sort of shots you want. Uh, it's always interesting to get a bit of behaviour, um, not just necessarily a portrait shot. And if you can get some interactions between animals, it might mean that you, you know, that the uh, the badger photo that I showed you at the start. Um, if I'd held on for another. Uh, I don't know, maybe 30 seconds or so, the mother actually appeared right behind the cub. Um, but unfortunately, you know, I I shot the, I mean, I just wanted a cub really. I didn't know that the mum was going to come over the corner as well. So I, I did take the photo, which kind of spooked the cub. So the cub actually moved into the, into the, the, the bluebell slightly. Uh, and so I've, I've got another photo of the mum, but um, I didn't get a photo of them both together. So it's not always necessarily a good thing to just fire off straight away. Um, record your interactions, that's great. Um, I like to keep a little notebook of, of what's going on. See if I've got a site I keep returning to. Um, and I, I, you know, I always used to think that I'd remember everything, but I don't remember everything. Um, so I've been out to the Fox site today, um, just looking from the binoculars from you know quite a distance away. So I had no disturbance whatsoever, but I saw the male fox running around. So I've recorded that and the time. And so that all goes into the planning of, of my next visit, which hopefully maybe tomorrow afternoon um, to try and get some shots. Uh, I can strongly recommend putting a little bit more planning in than you perhaps think. Um, and if it's a little bit rigid to start with, then that's cool. Uh, you'll get more and more natural at it. And, and, you know, it might be just on your journey there uh, to wherever you're going. Um, you know, that might be the limit of, of your planning, but that's cool too. And then, if all else fails, stick up an auto and kick away because a photo, you know, of something is better than no photo at all. So don't panic and, and don't don't be scared of using auto. Um, but yeah, get out of practice is, is one thing I can uh, recommend more than anything. So hopefully I haven't gone on for too long and bored you all senseless, uh, but I would welcome any questions that anyone's got. Amazing. Thanks so much, Dave. That was a really great talk. I think um from my perspective as a beginner it's really useful to have a really like comprehensive and compact kind of talk um because i think there's a lot of technical information when it comes to taking good photographs and i think you've just given a really good introduction but with enough, enough depth that you can really sort of understand it so i think it's really inspiring and a lot of people will end up going out with their cameras now and taking lots of photos oh, so um oh, thank you, thank you. sorry Dave. Um, yeah, keep so <laughs> keep talking. Okay, um, so if you guys have any questions, um, if you could sort of put them in the chat um, and yeah, any questions you have, um, and I'll read them out and Dave can answer them for you. Um, if you have a particular desire to sort of do it face to face, then um, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, but yeah, so the chat box is there for you um, to use now. But um, in the meantime, I'll just ask one of my questions. And you kind of asked, answered it already, um, talking about being trigger happy. Um, but I just remember when I was in Kenya with you, I was there with my camera, like taking too many photos. And I knew I was taking too many photos, but it was like, I just want to get the right photograph. Um, and meanwhile, you'd be there and you'd just sort of take one photo and move on with your life and you'd get amazing photographs. Um, so is that do you think it's sort of a skill that you have learned over time just because of practice that you know when you're taking the photo that it's going to be a good one a good enough one to then just sort of put your camera down and and leave um yeah go ahead. yeah good question i think um certainly i think when i started out i took an awful lot more and i think the the challenge of post processing an awful lot of photos and deleting seemingly endless reams of identical photographs has probably um, forced me into, into trying to be a bit more selective in what I take photos of. Um, and I think also um, the more you kind of watch wildlife, the more you watch a particular species and what have you, you get a bit more accustomed to what they might or might not do. And so um, you start to anticipate it's kind of not quite a sixth sense or anything, but you know, you start to be able to anticipate what they that they might be doing something interesting, and so that's when I'll reel off a couple of shots um, rather than kind of just the general like, okay, cool. Um, I mean, particularly within in Kenya, you know, 
a lot of the, the the kind of interactions that we had i feel like we had quite a decent amount of time with with a lot of the animals and so you could kind of you had the time to consider the shot and and think about right what sort of composition do i want to do how do i want to frame it and all that sort of stuff which perhaps in this country with a slightly more scatty wildlife um you know you're not on a safari bus where the animals are very used to seeing people that you might not have that opportunity and say so, yeah don't feel bad about reeling off some shots but um also i think i've started to learn to enjoy the moment a little bit and try and you know i certainly used to be very dedicated to try and getting a photo i've got to get the shot i've got to get the shot but a lot of the time you know now um if 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 i think that i'm going to disturb the, the animal by taking a photo then I, i'll often just not take the photo and just enjoy that moment um which i think is quite nice one thing i, I did kind of forget to mention um which will aid everyone in composition is actually get on your knees and take the photo to get down at the same level as the animal that you're taking um will massively improve the the, the the look of your photo because a lot of the time it will separate the 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 individual from the background a lot more um and it just it gives a feeling that you're in that in that photo um but yes sorry i digressed slightly no, it sounds great thank you um so we have a question from tad here um, drawing on what you just said about disturbing animals. Um, so he says, does using flash to shoot nocturnal animals disturb or even cause some distress? Um, it's a very tricky question. And I think you can do an awful lot of reading about it and, and everyone's got a kind of different view on it. Um, it's, it's very dependent on the particular species. You've got to, you know, consider that potentially some of these species have got really um, amazing eyesight some got pretty poor eyesight and and they don't rely on their sight very much and so potentially those sorts of species perhaps aren't so disturbed by uh flash photography as the ones that really do rely on their eyesight um i i tend not to use flash photography um with wildlife um i don't think it's particularly nice experience for any animal um and also if you're starting to use flash i, I don't necessarily really enjoy the look of um a photograph that's taken with flash um, occasionally you can use what's called fill flash and so for example on the badger photo that's on the screen here at the moment the cub underneath the cub under his you know his chest and his belly there's uh, a fairly big dark patch and so what i could have done was used a bit of flash which you know the light in this instance was generally coming in from the kind of top right of the scene and so it's light it, that's why his belly is so dark but if I used a bit of fill flash, then um, even on a relatively low setting, it could have just brightened up his kind of underside there. And I, I think fill flash is, is not quite so invasive because generally speaking, it, it's in conjunction with natural light. But if you're going from complete darkness to a massive flash of very bright light, then it, it can be quite disruptive. Um, that's not to say that you shouldn't always, you shouldn't necessarily ever do it. You know, consider that these animals will experience lightning um, and they'll be used to those sorts of flashes of light um, potentially. So, you know, it's, it's, yeah, I think it's a tricky, tricky one and every situation is difficult. But consider how much the animal is right on the site and then you, you'll have a fair idea as to how much it would dis disturb him. All in the consideration of the context, I guess. Um, so we've got two similar questions here from Emily and Ellie, um, both saying thank you for a really interesting talk. Um, asking what to look for in a tripod, um, and do you have any recommendations for heavier lenses? Oh, okay. Um, so things to look at for a tripod. Um, you can buy a cheap tripod and it'll wobble, and particularly if you've got um, a, you know, a heavy camera with a heavy lens, um, and, and that's obviously completely against the point of a tripod. Um, so you can look at uh, lightweight ones, which are great, but they'll be a bit more expensive, you know, carbon fiber ones, which are really easy to carry around, but they're not always necessarily um, that cheap. Well, they're, they're definitely not that cheap. Um, what you need to consider is yeah, a lot of them will have maximum. Mm. 
way. Uh, there's a, a various different types of tripod head. I've actually got one that's called a unique ball, um, which is um, is a, a, it's quite a specialised bit kit, but it, it's, it's, it kind of suits all, a lot of purposes. And so I, I do recommend a unique ball one. Um, tripod itself, I've got a, um, a Kitos one, um, which is kind of one of the, the main brands, Kitos or Manfrotto. I don't know how you pronounce them, but that's how I say it. Uh, and so those two are, are quite good options. Um, a lot of the time with tripods, they'll have a central stem, which which you can raise up the, the, the kind of tripod head bit. Um, I tend not to use that at all because it ends up inducing a bit more wobble or potential wobble. Um, and also you want to consider how low it goes to the ground, um, particularly for taking photos. Look, well, I like the budget. I don't want to keep coming back to him, but this was taken using a tripod. Um, and you want to be able to get your camera, you know, only a couple of inches off the ground, which often tripods will limit you and that you'll have to be, you know, two foot, three foot off the ground. Um, so do consider that. The one, the tripod that I've got, um, I actually cut the, the middle stem out, which enable it to go to much lower. Uh, so don't be scared of doing that. Um, but yes, and then what, sorry, what was the other half of that question? Heavy and lenses. Heavier lenses, yeah. Uh, in terms of a uh, recommendation for a lens? Yeah. Okay, so, I mean, again, it, it'll depend what you want to take photos of. If you're looking at wildlife, then generally speaking, you want something with quite a bit of reach. So, and if it up to kind of, um, you know, 200 and above, really, 200 millimeters or above is, is really a minimum for, for wildlife a lot of the time. Uh, it's, not, it's not essential, but, you know, it will, it will make your life a little bit easier. Um, I started out with a, a Sigma 150 to 300, I think it was, or 120 to 300, which is a great lens, not too expensive. Um, if, you've, uh, if you've got, you know, a Nikon or Canon, then the glass is sometimes better quality. But, you know, nowadays there's, an all, there's not an awful lot to choose between, between the lenses. There's a lot of reviews out there. Uh, a friend of mine uses um, the Sigma 150 to 600. Which again is is for what reach you get is is a wonderful lens um, for getting close to your subjects. Mine, uh, the one I use at the minute is a 200 to 400. Um, it's a Nikon lens, which is again is lovely in terms of the clarity. But you don't have to spend a fortune. Um, yeah, to, you know, do a bit of research. Second hand is is wonderful. There's lots of second hand websites for for second hand um, for photographic equipment. Um, so yeah, try try them to start with. Um, yeah, and just to add on to that, I think I may have either misinterpreted the question or, um, but as Emily's just said, um, she meant tripods to hold heavier lenses. So sort of, yeah, have you got any recommendations for specific tripods for the heavier lenses too? Um, again, I mean, it'll come down to, to checking the, the specifications of, it, of each tripod. I mean, yeah, like I said before, my camera equipment's pretty heavy. Uh, the lens itself is uh, a good four or five kilos, I think. Um, and then you've got the camera body as well, which is another kind of kilo, maybe kilo and a half. Um, and so the, the, the tripods that I've, I've, well, the tripod that I use, has got a, it's quite a heavy weight one um, because I've got a heavy camera to put on it. And so, um, I don't know what type it is exactly, but it is, you know, if you go through the specifications of each of each um, tripod, then it will say the maximum kind of capacity of that tripod. So stick to that. Don't don't buy cheap necessarily. Um, if it's plastic, then it, it's not going to hold. You want the, the, the tripod to hold steady. You want it to remain in position. You know, you don't want it sagging. You know, I mean, my camera will sit on my tripod for a good couple of hours whilst I'm sat in a hedge. I don't want it to move. And then when I, you know, when the fox appears, it to not be facing in the right direction. Um, and so that, you know, it is, you know, it can be quite expensive shelling out for a decent tripod and tripod head. But I have to admit, it's, it's, it's actually an investment that I, you know, I didn't really want to make because you want to spend money on your camera and your lenses but it has helped an enormous amount. So the, the tripod head, the unique ball one that I use is spelled U-N-I-Q and then ball. 
they do two varieties so one for a heavier camera and one for a more lightweight camera again unfortunately these are quite expensive bits of kit but you know you don't always have to buy the most expensive um read some reviews there's loads of reviews out there um and if you you know if you want me to have a look at some then feel free to email and I'll, i can have a look at and, and perhaps recommend some um or even tell you which one I've, I've got but it's in the van so i don't really i don't really know off the top of my head perfect thank you um okay so we've got a message from fletch saying are there any areas around falmouth or cornwall uh, that you could recommend as a good place to hang around to just get some general practice for beginners uh yes um so um to hit woods is a really great place if you want to practice taking photos of kind of mammals the squirrels there are pretty tame um particularly if you've got a bag of peanuts in your pocket they'll be climbing on you um obviously that's you know not necessarily what you what you always want but that's a good place to start you and you know you do get other things there as well but the squirrels are particularly easy to come across um at Tahiti Woods um there's another little gem near Falmouth called uh Kennel Vale uh, nature reserve it's a wildlife trust site it's kind of well, I think it's still closed at the minute um, because they can't do social distancing now or something because the paths are quite thin. But um, that's another good site for, for squirrels and for some cool birds that, that float around in the river. Um, equally, um, you know, down south pool is pretty good um, for, for, for life, for, for sort of bird life. Um, I mean, birds are pretty hard to, to photograph, right? So they might not be the most exciting things to photograph necessarily, but they're a really good way to practice your skills because, you know, they can move fast. You can do ones that are flying, which is particularly difficult, um, and get your eye in, getting your camera moving, using different focus modes and stuff like that. So, you know, that's a, that's a good place to start. Don't be scared of lying on the floor next to the boating lake down there. Um, you might look stupid, but you know you, you'll improve your shots immensely just by getting low um, and in, in kind of the same height as the animal that you're trying to take a photo of. So those are probably good ones around that sort of area. Yeah, we can probably get plenty of uh, seagull photos in and around. <laughs> yeah. um, OK, so we've got a question from Marta saying, I'm considering buying my first telephoto lens. Do you have any advice on that? OK. Um, Yeah, set up a budget uh, and spend as much as you possibly can because it, you know, generally speaking, the more money you spend, it will get better and better quality. Um, depending on what brand your camera is, uh, whether it's Nikon or Canon or Sony or whatever or Panasonic, you don't necessarily have to go with, you know, one of their model fit lenses. Um, you know, the Sigma ones, they're, they're kind of brands that make lenses for a range of different cameras, Sigma, Tamron, um, they're both pretty good now. Um, you know, I, I mean, depending on how much you want to spend, um, I would recommend um, perhaps one of the Sigma, either the 150 to 600, that's a really good lens. Um, if you can't afford that, then just roll it back. You can get kind of, I think, this is one that's up to 400. I can't remember what it starts at, but they're, you know, yeah, I started definitely started out with Sigma lenses and, and thought they were fantastic. And well, this badge of photo here is a Sigma 320 to no, for 120 to 4 300, I think it was. Um, so yeah, that's a good lens. Again, if you want me to have a look at stuff, then feel free to email me. I don't mind answering photography questions, like any excuse to talk about photography, that's fine. Um, but yeah, I would I would strongly recommend doing a bit of research. Um, there's plenty of reviews out there. Go on Flickr as well, and, and a lot of the time on Flickr, they'll have the, the details of what lens has taken what photo. So, you know, you can go and uh, type in the lens that you're looking at, and it will bring up a whole host of photos that have been taken using that lens. Um, and so that's, you know, an easy way to compare different qualities of photo, uh, of, of, sorry, of, of, of uh, telephoto lens. But yeah, go for what you can afford. Another option is to go for uh, what's called a teleconverter. Um, so potentially if you can't, you know, the longer limits of these telephoto lenses, the price ramps up quite quickly. 
but what you can do is is um, spend a, a decent amount of money on you know a perhaps a short a focal distance one so maybe a, up to a 200 or a 300 lens um, and spend a bit more to get a better quality lens or a faster lens so you know think about the the f value sorry i'm going to get a bit tech techy but the jar the the each lens will have a um a maximum aperture that it can go to so you know in the badger photo on here i've got f 2.8 and so this lens was quite a fast lens it's called a fast lens because it's got a a, a a big aperture a small number so you want to be considering that as well um and try and pick a, a one that goes my lens that i use at the minute it's max aperture is f4 um and so you know that will give me uh that's a quite a fast lens lots of light being able to come in you can get the, chip, the, the slightly cheaper ones the f value will start to go up uh, particularly at the most zoomed in level so if you can get constant aperture all the way through that's always advantageous um but you know again it's not essential none of this stuff is essential um so you know do a bit of research uh spend what you can afford but yeah also sorry <laughs> Coming back to that bit, uh, you can get teleconverters. So it's another additional little bit that you kind of stick on in between the, the lens and the camera, which will multiply um, your your lens. So you can get a, a 1.4 multiplier or a two times multiplier, and you'll drop some light, um, but equally it'll get you a bit more reach. Perfect, thank you. I think we had a similar question from Robin. So hopefully that's answered that for you as well, Robin. Um, Henry is asking, what do you do with your photos once you've completed editing? So where and what is the market? <laughs> um, it's a tricky one. Um, I mean, uh, the majority of my photo, my, I say the majority, yeah, the majority of my photos sit on my hard drive and go nowhere other than for me to enjoy. Um, and even that doesn't happen as often as I would like. Um, you know, the, the I'll post some on Instagram. I've got a website, so I'll post them on there. Um, those are the kind of two main places. And unfortunately, you know, there's not an awful lot of money to be made in wildlife photography unless you get lucky. Um, I mean, this, apologies for keep coming back to this badger photo, but this badger photo I took, I don't know, four or five years ago. Um, and I posted it online and all the rest of it, and it got no traction whatever, whatsoever. Entered it in a couple of photo competitions, which is a really good way to get more exposure. Nothing ever came of it. And then um, recently, in, uh, after we came back from Kenya, actually earlier this year, um, I, uh, there was a photography competition, and I just thought, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll enter a couple of photos. So I stuck in a few from Kenya, and I thought, oh, well, I'll throw in the badger and see what happens. And this one got picked up and then before I knew it, you know, the um, the Woodland Trust were wanting it. They they purchased a license to use it for something. Um, Springwatch then wanted it to use for, for, for their social media stuff. And all of a sudden those sorts of bits of exposure um, knocked on and I, I got a few more website sales. Um, this, the other, it's, it's really tricky um, knowing where to put them and what photographic competitions to enter. You know, there's a lot of them now you have to pay to enter, which isn't great, but obviously they've got to make their money as well. So it's, it's kind of a quite a selective process about what you're going to do with them. Um, you know, I think for, for them to be noticed, unfortunately they've got to be pretty spectacular, particularly, you know, a nice setting or a particular amazing bit of um, lighting or, or this that, and the other. Um, so yeah, there's, I mean, there's various different sites you can um, apply to to join Jet Getty, as we've probably heard of, or you've certainly seen in, in news stories and what have you. And you can publish your photos on there, and people can browse them and purchase them um, that way. There's a number of different photography websites that you can post your photos on and get noticed that way. Um, yeah, it, it, it requires quite a bit of time and dedication, which. I don't necessarily always have in terms of getting your name out there to get the photos recognised um, and all the rest of it. But yeah, good luck. Um, there's a couple of online photo communities actually. One's called um, uh, Nature TTL, I think it is, um, which has got loads of uh, tutorials and stuff. And that was the, the photo competition that I actually uh, that that kind of got this badger photo noticed. Um, and before you know it, you know it, it was getting shared left, right, and centre by 
um, the BBC channels, which is cool. Um, but yeah, it's all died down again now. So uh, got to find my next photo. I think it is quite powerful when you can get like your badger photo. Um, it really is stunning. And I think it's particularly powerful because it is British wildlife. I think in a way it's easier to get an amazing photo of, of a lion in a safari park. But when you get such an amazing photo of something in the UK, I, don't, I think we're not very used to seeing wildlife out and about. It's particularly like the mammals, like badgers. So um, yeah, I think it's an amazing photograph. Um, so you. leading kind of on from what Henry started off saying about the editing, um, Ben has asked, um, which says, thanks Dave, uh, what editing software do you use? And what would you recommend for beginners or people on a budget to use for editing? For editing? Um, so I use um, Adobe Lightroom. Um, which uh, I pay a subscription for every month. If you're lucky enough to be a student like me, then there's discounts to be had uh, um, using Lightroom, and that's probably your, your kind of go-to industry-leading kind of bit of software. It's not the cheapest. I can't off the top of my head remember exactly how much it is, but um, that's what I use, and it's got a whole host of stuff, which is really useful and, and, and very easy, to, well, relatively easy to use once you've got your head around it. A lot of the cameras nowadays, when you buy the camera themselves, they have got dedicated uh, bits of software. Um, I know Nikon definitely do. Um, I assume probably Canon do do similar. And these, you know, they're all all pretty good. Uh, they all do very similar things. Um, to uh, you know, it's normally the user interface which is the different bit, which makes it easier or harder to do, to do certain things. Um, I think there's also there's a couple of free ones. Uh, I can't off the top of my head. Uh, let me just scan here quickly. Can't off the top of my head remember exactly what they're called. Um, but uh, hold on, sorry, excuse me. Uh, there used to be uh, a cheaper version of the Adobe one, um, which was quite good. Um, there's another one called uh, GIMP, uh, which is, is quite highly recommended for various people. Uh, that was a couple of years ago that I used to use that, but um, I, I assume it's probably still going. Um, if you Google free uh, photo editing software, then there is a few that, that actually come up. Um, and, and to be honest, the, the, the main differences are that the user interface and how easy it, it makes things become. So um, have a little look. Adobe Lightroom, you can do a trial version as well, I think for um, a limited time. So that might be something you want to invest in. Um, it also helps organize all the storage of your photos and all that sort of stuff. You can keyword stuff uh, and, and tag it so it makes it an awful lot easier to find photos, particularly as your library of pictures gets stacked out um, and then someone says, have you got any badger pictures? Then, um, you know, you can just type in badger and it will bring up all your badger photos, which is, is definitely very useful. Um, otherwise you're trawling through thousands of photos trying to find that one badger picture that you know is quite a good one. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, so we've got a uh, question from Maria saying, um, first of all, thank you for the talk. Beautiful shot. How did you go about remembering all the settings and numbers involved with more manual photography in the beginning? And do you have any tips? Um, sadly, a lot of trial and error, and a lot of missed shots, which you get home. It's one thing looking at the camera, you know, the screen on the back of your camera and going, oh, that looks good. But I, I don't ever say that anymore until I get home and I've seen it on the big screen because um, what you think it could be a, a, a good shot is, is very quickly rubbished when you get it on the big screen. And what you think it could be a bad shot can quite often be, be um, a lovely shot on the screen when you get it back. So yeah, um, I, would, I would recommend starting with um, that aperture priority setting and then you can you start playing around, set, set certain things to be you know minimum value. So set it on aperture priority, then set your minimum shutter speed to, to one over um, your focal length. So if you've got say a 400 mil lens, then set your minimum shutter speed to maybe one over four hundredths of a second. Uh, that way you're pretty much guaranteed to remove any camera shake that you in, 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 induce. Um, 
ideally you'd, you'd want to be quicker but you know if you set that as the slowest possible speed then 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 you're going to be all right and then if you set your iso to equally to a a, a maximum setting so put it on auto but maximum say six thousand ten thousand something in that sort of region and then just play with the aperture uh, and then you can start to to understand what's going on and then you can start and, you know when you review your pictures online when you get them back onto your computer actually have a look at the settings that the, 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 the uh, camera decided to use um, and as you get more and more experience with it you'll you'll start to understand which ones you need to change or what needs to be your maximum minimum and then you'll have your kind of go-to safety zones that you'll that you'll kind of resort to if nothing else is working um, but yeah, unfortunately, it's a bit of trial and error, and it might seem daunting to start with. But just keep practicing. Um, if you've got, you know, go and take some boring photos of seagulls. Not, some people won't really like them, but you know, some some dull photos of, of birds in, in your back garden, or you know, the, the most common species possible, and just get practicing and understanding what happens if you do this, that, and the other. And then when you get out into the field, and you, you know, you've got a badger running towards you, or whatever then you, you know, right, I need to be there, I need to be this. Um, yeah, a lot of the time it will revolve around how much light you've got to play with, particularly with um, mammals. You know, in this country, unfortunately, the vast majority like to come out at dusk and, and dawn. So, you know, you're always going to be battling the light a little bit. Um, you might get lucky, but yeah. A bit of practice makes perfect then with most things, I guess. Um, just for anyone who's not sort of looking at the chat, um, just back to the previous question, we've got um, some people saying that uh, GIMP is great. Um, David saying that it's an open source version of Photoshop and might be able to do some stuff with that, but I don't find it that accessible. We've also got people saying um, I use raw therapy. It can be a bit fiddly, but I found it quite good for free. Um, and also, and also um, Darktable is a free alternative to Lightroom. That's what people are saying about that. Very good. I don't know the first thing about it, so um, <laughs> I, won't, I won't comment. Um, we've also got another question um, by Fletch, if I can find it, um, saying, um, just like to say thanks, and if you have any advice or where um, to look into if you're particularly interested in marine photography. Um, do you, okay, do you mean like underwater or, or above water? Um, it just sort of says marine, so I'm gonna, <laughs> okay. gonna um, <laughs> say I mean, in I general. I don't do an awful lot of underwater stuff. Uh, oh, sorry, you said I'm, underwater mainly. Okay, um, so there's a guy in Cornwall, um, I can't remember what his name is. Uh, I will try and find out his name, um, but he does some really great underwater photography stuff. The problem with underwater photography a lot of the time is, is the housing is you know the waterproof housing for your camera is really really expensive often more than the camera itself um, if you want to get seriously into it um, a good start with where you can uh, you can make a good start with gopros um, one bit of kit that i bought this this well last year actually um, to improve your kind of gopro photos you can get these um, domes that sit on the front i think that if you google gopro dome then essentially it's a semicircular or semi-spherical dome and your your gopro sits in the middle of it uh, and the, the gopro and the, this dome flip, flips around the outside and it kind of makes it an awful lot easier to get those kind of half in the water half out the shots half out the water shots which are really cool you know if you've got um dolphins and stuff like that then you know potentially you can get a bit of above water footage i've got some lovely photos of turtles in that sort of fashion um, whereby you know you've got half above the water and half below the water in in your shot um, so yeah I can recommend that sort of stuff um, but yeah unfortunately normally I mean I've looked into underwater photography a few times um, just as another thing to kind of play around with but the housing for your camera is often ex uh, you know prohibitively expensive um, but yeah, you can get out and do some GoPro stuff, which is great and a little bit more accessible. But yeah, to see, see what sort of uh, additional extras you can get, yeah, particularly with the GoPros, you can get um, colour filters that fit over the front of the lens. Um, generally speaking, if you're going underwater, particularly the deeper you go, you want to get a red filter on the front uh, and that will improve the kind of colours 
in your photos. Um, so that and one of those semicircular dome things, um, I recommend as, as, as a good starter to improve stuff. Oh yeah, sounds good. Um, so we've got another question from David saying, what's your favorite motive and what do you find most boring? My favorite motive? Yeah, I assume sort of causes photography, I think um, it means. Correct me if I'm wrong, David. <laughs> Um, I don't know, I mean, I yeah, what you it. make a shot of is what he's saying. So, what what's your favourite thing to take a shot of? Like, what animal? Uh, he's saying. Um, it's a real toss up between um, badgers and foxes for me at the moment. Um, it does vary, um, and I'll get particularly into one thing um, depending on what I can find. Really, I'd I'd really like to find some um, stoats or weasels. Uh, I've, I've seen a couple here and there, I've never got a photo of one, so generally speaking I've got one or two things on the go where I, I, I've kind of almost, well not guaranteed, but I, I know where there's some activity, and so at the minute I've got uh, maybe six or seven different badger sets which I'm, I, I kind of actively keep an eye on. Um, I've got, well just recently managed to find some foxes, they were and they seem to come around every couple of years um, at particular locations. So I'm really delighted to have some foxes on the go at the minute. And so my attention has been drawn to the foxes at the moment. Um, uh, but yeah, you know, I, I, you know, I'm always looking for more stuff. The, the camera traps are wonderful pieces of kit, you know, and you don't have to spend a fortune on a camera trap to, to get to know what's in your surrounding area. Um, I've recently had otter on my camera trap, which is really cool. Um, and so I've been slowly narrowing down where the, where I've got two camera traps. And so on this one stretch of river, I've been tr trying to slowly narrow down where I might be the most, get the most chance of finding an otter to photograph. Um, and so that's kind of taking quite a lot of time as well, uh, revisiting those, those, those camera traps and what have you. Um, yeah, I mean, I just, I genuinely love this picture and, and for me a lot of the, the passion becomes from the field craft and, and getting into position and and just experiencing, you know, what they are and, and how they behave and all the rest of it. It's, you know, this one particular, not this badger shop, but the, the, the badger set, which is the closest one to me here, which I've been able to visit uh, during lockdown, on, you know, it's a walking distance from my house. And just lying there on the floor, you know, with them completely, you know, they'll have a sniff and, you know, I've had badger cubs, you know, a metre and a half, two metres away from my face. You know, they'll be just thinking that, you know, if you don't move, if you can sit there motionless, you know, you know, they're expecting people to be stood up right a lot of the time. So if you're on the floor making your shape different to what they expect maybe a human is, then they're a lot less likely to be, um, scared by you and having that time with them is yeah there's nothing more special so yeah that's my passion really oh, sorry i think i digressed slightly but hopefully that answered your question <laughs> no definitely i think yeah when you've got a camera in your hand i think you really appreciate sort of the beauty of everything more i don't know whether that's just me um i think we're gonna have to sort of wrap up in a, win in a minute but we'll just have one last question from steve um, who says, thanks, very interesting talk. Any tips for getting the best out of your mobile phone for those times when it is all that you have with you? Um, yeah, uh, think about the light most importantly, um, I would suggest. Um, and try and think about the composition of your image. Like, so the stuff I talked about earlier, think about what you can put in the foreground to make it more interesting. Don't just, you know, if you've got a particular, you know, nice scenery shot or something, then you don't necessarily just want you know everything to be far off. You want something in the foreground to start enticing the the, the, the viewer into the image. So if you've got if you've got some sort of wildlife in in the picture, then try and you know the phone, unless you're particularly close to it and you're very lucky to be particularly close with your mobile, then you're gonna have to think about the composition of the shot to try and tell some sort of story in terms of getting some background in as well as um, you know, the, the habitat of the animal. And then um, whereabouts do you position the animal in the photo? Um, 
it's a good thing. And you know, the one thing I, I know I kind of missed out in the talk, but I tried to add it in the end when when speaking to Sam is about you know your height of, of where you're taking a photo from. You'll be amazed at the difference it, it makes just by getting onto your knees um, or, or even lower just to take the photo. It might mean you can get a little bit of grass in the foreground. It might just mean that there's that little bit more separation between the, the uh, subject of your photo and the background. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, you know, obviously I don't always get the camera out with me because it weighs a ton. And it's, uh, but I, I do try to, but I always have, well, I nearly always have my mobile with me. So um, yeah, there's nothing wrong with taking photos with your mobile. And like I said before, if you've, if you've got a pair of binoculars, you can kind of tie them in together and that might just get you that extra bit of zoom. Um, that, that you need. So, so practice that as well. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Dave. Um, that's been some really great advice. We've got lots of people in the chat saying um, that your talk was really informative and fun. Thanks for um, having a brilliant talk, um, all this kind of stuff. So have a look in the chat if you get a chance because lots of nice compliments to, to well, 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 Thank you very much. That's very kind. And uh, yeah, if, if, you know, I'm always happy to talk talk wildlife photography or cameras or have a geek out session about cameras and lenses so if you want to drop me an email or whatever then feel free um, and I'll, I can try and um, help and advise or, or whatever but thank you very much for, for having Please. me and thanks very much for listening thank you so normally at this point um david unmutes everyone so we can do a bit of a round of applause so um hopefully you'll all be unmuted in a minute um and we could all give an applause for dave <laughs> so let's start <laughs> Thanks everyone for coming and um, yeah next week we've got a talk on weather forecasting so hope to see some of you there then.